Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. I can feel his mighty power and his grace. I can hear the brush of angels' wings. I see glory on each face. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. All right, good morning, everyone. We're glad you're here. Uh, surely the presence of the Lord is in this place this morning because we're here we're, and we're here to worship God. I'm so excited to see all your happy and smiling faces and those of you who are wearing masks. I assume you're not frowning at me, but if you are, I know. Just believe me, I do. My name is Trevor Richt. I'm the preaching minister here at the 8th and Harrison Church of Christ. Uh, a few minutes ago, I heard uh, the thunder coming down and the lightning probably coming down as well. And that means rain. And I'm pretty sure it's because the sky is crying because I'm about to say some, a long-winded message today. So the weather might react how many of you are feeling today. But this morning, the only really announcement that I have is that, you know, we have summer youth interns that are going to be here in just a few weeks. It seems crazy that I'm saying that because I remember announcing this months ago, uh, but the time is surely going to come here pretty soon at the end of here in May. Uh, Holly is going to be one of our youth interns, and we're also having a student from Oklahoma Christian named Levi who's joining us as well. And what we would like for all of you to do is to pick a Sunday and take one of take the interns either out to lunch or take uh, the interns maybe home for a, a home cooked meal. I know there are a lot of wonderful chefs in here and cooks that could whip up a better meal than I could in my sleep. So we encourage you to do that, and I would really ask that our church do this because this is one way that we get to give back to our interns who are going to work so hard with our kids this summer. And so if you would like to do that, please see Annabeth and who will help you sign up for a date for that. We want you guys to do that, and even if you hear that the list is full, you can still try to invite them over during the week. And so we would really ask that y'all do this, because as a church family, we want to help take care of them as they're taking care of our kids. And we're going to be talking about our kids and our youth group here later today in the sermon. But as Shane continues to lead us in some songs, I ask that you open your hearts and your minds to where God is leading you today, and I ask that those words impact you. And so let's continue singing. Sing hallelujah to the Lord. Sing hallelujah to the Lord. Sing hallelujah. Sing hallelujah. Sing hallelujah to the Lord. Jesus is risen from the dead. Jesus is from the dead, Jesus is risen, Jesus is risen, Jesus is risen from the dead, Jesus is living in his church, Jesus is living in his church. back to play his own. He's coming back. He's coming back. He's coming back to play his own. Come thou fount of every blessing to my heart to sing thy praise. Streams of Oh, to grace. 
Please join me in prayer. Our Father God, we humbly come before you this morning, Father. Not only grateful, Father, for the day that you've given us, but the Lord's day, Father, that we as your children can gather and worship you. And we pray that all we do and say will be in your acceptance, Father. Father, we pray this morning we know of so many that are struggling with health problems during these times. We pray, Father, your blessings will be on them and that they might once again, Father, have their health. Father, we pray this morning for the 8th and Harrison Church of Christ. We pray, Father, that you be with us as a church family, that the things we do will always put it, be putting you first, Father. And we pray for our elders, Father. We know sometimes the load can be very heavy, and we pray, Father, that you'll bless each one of our elders and their families, Father. And we pray, Father, as we continue our service this morning, I pray that you will be with us, and through this day, Father, these things we pray in Christ's name, amen. Yeah. 
Good morning. If y'all will pray with me. Lord, thank you for this day and for letting us come together to take part in this communion. As we begin, I ask you to clear our hearts and our minds of our weariness and frustrations, of our anxieties and our worldly troubles, and help us to focus on this communion of spiritual reunion. Heavenly Father, thank you for this bread. Amen. Heavenly Father, we come to you again, and we come to you to thank you for this fruit of the vine. In your son's name we pray, amen. morning everybody we're reading from deuteronomy chapter 6 verses 1 2 and 3 we read from the king james version so it might be a little different now these are the commandments the statutes and the judgments which the lord your god commanded to teach you that ye might do them in the land whether ye go to possess it that thou mightest fear the lord thy god to keep all his statutes and his commandments which i command thee though and thy son, and thy son's son, all the days of thy life, and that thy days may be prolonged. Hear therefore, O Israel, and observe to do it, that it may be well with thee, and that ye may increase mightily, as the Lord God of thy fathers hath promised thee, in the land that floweth with milk and honey. All right, good morning, everyone. Good morning. 
All right, guys, I appreciate that. We have a really good response this morning. I won't make you do it again this time, but I want to keep it going. I also do appreciate that when other people get up here and they say good morning, you say it back, because that's a great way that we're engaging in church service. But I'm glad that you're all here today because I think this is a great topic that we get to discuss this morning as we're talking about investing in the future. I told you we're going to be talking about kids today, and I don't just mean the little kids, but also uh, our youth group, our younger generation in our church. And as we begin, I just want to ask that all of you try to think of your favorite church memory. Take a moment to think about a favorite time you had in church. It could have been when you were a kid. Um, For those of you who were maybe converted later in life, think about a favorite moment you had in church. But I was fortunate enough to grow up in the church. When I was a few weeks old, my mom brought me to church because she was the nursery teacher, so I guess I kind of had to go to class. But she taught me for the first few years of my life, and she taught the nursery class at our church for 25 years. And she taught us with the felt board. And I know as soon as I say felt board, some of you have no idea what that is, and I feel sorry for you. But I also learned in that Bible class to pat, pat the Bible. And there were some wonderful kid songs that I learned there. And then after I went out of nursery class, I went to a class for three, four, and five-year-olds. I couldn't tell you who my teachers were because, you know, I was a kid and they weren't my mom, so I had no idea who they were. But I do know that they were the couple of people that were the Estenikis or there were the Melodas or other young people in our church who wanted to help and teach us. I understand that none of you have any idea of who I'm talking about, but I want you to know that I remember that there were people stepping up to teach our kids. When I was in first and second grade, I had a teacher named Rob McIntosh, and he wanted to challenge all of us kids in first and second grade to know the books of the Bible, the 66 books of the Bible. And so even when we didn't know all of them, he taught us those songs, which I still say today because if I say turn to a book in the Bible like Obadiah, some of you are like, where in the world is Obadiah? But I start singing that song so I can find my place, and that still impacts me today. When I was in the third and the fourth grade, I had a teacher named Mr. Smith. And Mr. Smith had a military background, so he was a little bit harder, a little bit rougher on the edges. But he wanted us to know about God. When he would tell us stories like David and Goliath, he wouldn't end the class by saying, okay, so who killed Goliath? He would say, I want you to look at David, and I want you to ask yourself, how is he a good example of faith? How does he teach you what it's like to have a relationship with God? And you might think, well, that's a big question for a third and fourth grader to think about. But he wanted us to know what it was like to know God. He wanted to push us in our faith even when we were still kids. When I was in the fifth and sixth grade, I had this sweet old lady named Johnny Conway, and she loved all of us. When you would come in, she would give you a hug. You would sit down. You'd fill out a fill in the blank. You would read the passage, and then she would teach you more about the Bible. And then I remember going into the youth group, which that was a big time. Once you leave sixth grade, go into seventh grade, I mean, that's where the big leagues are. I remember going into the youth group, and I was excited because we had an awesome youth minister named Phil, and he taught us great Bible lessons. And the thing was, even though I was in seventh grade, I was in class with 12 graders, and so Phil had some pretty hard topics for us to discuss at times, and he would break it down so us younger students could understand But then he'd also build it back up and push us in our faith. Phil took us on mission trips. He took us to retreats. He had other people from the church join us in lock-ins and other events and devotionals to help us in our faith. And I could tell story after story about those who helped me grow in my faith. But most importantly, I remember that as a church, they invested in my relationship with God. Because when it comes to the future generation of our church, our children, our kids, the youth group, it is all of our responsibility as a church to help bring them up in their relationship with God. It doesn't just fall on their parents. It is our collective responsibility. And I want us to look at some passages that talk about the importance of the younger generation. If you want to open your Bibles, I first want to start in Matthew chapter 18, verses 1 through 5. And as we read this passage, I want you to see how these characters react, what they are doing, the things they say. 
And so starting out in Matthew chapter 18, verses 1 through 5, it says this. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? He called a little child to him and placed the child among them. And he said, Truly I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever takes the lowly position of this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And here's what I think is key here in verse 5. He says, whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. So let's break down this passage. Let's see what's going on here. First, the disciples come up to Jesus. And I always feel bad for the disciples because we read what they say and we think, they're pretty dumb sometimes. But they come up to Jesus with this question, who is the greatest? And there are many different gospel versions that you can read about this. And really what the disciples are coming to Jesus is they're saying, we want you to rank all of your followers from the greatest to the least. And in some different gospels, they're really trying to say, Jesus, when we die, who's going to be at your right and left hand? They want to know who is the greatest among them that gets to be with Jesus. And Jesus looks around, and I'm sure they're waiting, is it going to be me? Is it going to be me? And he finds a child. I don't know how old the child is. And he brings the child into the circle of the conversation. Also, I do want to point out that they say, who then is the greatest? They've asked this question before and probably didn't like the answer. But Jesus brings a child to them, and he says, unless you become like one of these little children— you're not going to enter the kingdom of heaven if you take this lowly position of a child. And that might seem hard to understand why he says this lowly position, but it's because children weren't really cared about in the first century society. But Jesus cared about the children. He loved them from when they were infants to growing up kids to young adults and teenagers. He loved them. And the reason he says this lowly position is in the hierarchy of the first century, and this is just how it was, this is just a historical definition, on the top you had males. That's just how it was. And down the line you had women, children, slaves, and dirt. That is the very slim pattern we have right there. And the reason that children were not thought of as great is because they didn't contribute to society very much. Their parents sent them to school to learn, but they weren't working, they weren't, they weren't having philosoph philosophical discussions, so they didn't provide a lot. And so until that child grew up and did something, they, they didn't really care about them. You know, there's that phrase that children should be seen and not heard. Well, really, it was more like the children shouldn't be seen and heard until they reach a certain age and then they become a part of society. And Jesus is telling his disciples that unless you become like this child, you're not going to enter the kingdom of heaven. Also, whoever welcomes a child welcomes me. And I wonder if the inverse of that statement is a pretty harsh thing to swallow as well. Because when I read this passage, I want us to think about our own kids, our youth group, our, our children, the younger generation of the church, and think about how we treat them. Because I want us to literally take a page out of God's book and see what he says. And I want us to act like Jesus towards these children. I want us to look at our children and our youth group with the same way that Jesus looks at them. To see how he cares for them. To see how he interacts with them. To see how he goes up and has a conversation with them. Because sometimes when it comes to our youth group or our kids, we say, oh, well, they're not old enough to really know everything right now. You know, we know what's best. We're going to tell them what's right. Or we say, hey, they have a youth room up there upstairs. Like, that's their place. That's where they get to be and have discussions. But I don't really have to interact with them. Or we say, our kids and children are a part of our church, but they're just a part of our church. 
We don't take the extra mile of what it means to be with them, to interact with them, to listen to them and see what their thoughts or their feelings are because our children, our youth group, are an important and vital part of our church. We need to treat them with respect that we want because Jesus tells us that the, one of the greatest people in the kingdom of heaven is a child. Whoever welcomes a child welcomes me. So if we're not welcoming a child, we're not welcoming Jesus. Because here's the key point that I want us to realize, is that our children and youth group are the future. They are the future of this church, and the children and the youth group are the future of the church as a whole. If we want a future for our church, if we want a future for the kingdom, it starts with them. They are going to grow up in our church. They are going to hopefully have a relationship with God, but that's going to be directly impacted by how we choose to interact with them, to be with them. Because there are some scary statistics about children in the church. The numbers of children that are going and being involved in church are shrinking every year, and that's not just a COVID statistic. That is a real-life statistic. If you want to look at the statistics after youth group, the percentage of kids who go to church after they graduate high school goes down every year. They say on average, eight out of ten students who went to youth group in high school do not in college. They also say that there is 3%, and that is a shocking number to me, 3% of students surveyed who go to college say they attend church regularly. I have to imagine that's partially with their relationship with God and what they're going through, but I also can't help but imagine that that's impacted by those who have gone to be with them, to help them, and grow with them in the church. The church has a responsibility for these children, and it's not just their parents. It's all of us. Because if we say we're a church family, family includes those who are from one, or sorry, zero, one week, I'll say that, to 101 in one week. It includes everyone. Because sometimes our church can act like a barrier towards children, and I want you to see how that has played out. It's literally one chapter later in the Gospel of Matthew that something happens with kids that I cannot believe happens with these kids. If you want to read with me Matthew chapter 19, verses 13 through 15, and then I'm going to read verses 13 and 14 in Spanish for us, this is what it says. It says, Then people brought little children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them and pray for them. These families wanted to know more about Jesus and their kids to know about Jesus. And here's what happens. But the disciples rebuked them. They told them, mm -mm, no way. You step away from Jesus right now. You don't get to be with him. Jesus said, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. When he had placed his hands on them, he went from there. And I'm going to read verses 13 and 14 through Spanish. And if you don't speak Spanish, that's okay because I have the English up there as well. And I want you to read those words that are in English. It says, Llevaron unos niños a Jesús para que les impusiera las manos y orara por ellos, pero los discipulios respondían a quienes los llevaban. Jesús dijo, Dejen que los niños vengan a mí y no se lo impidan, porque el reino de los cielos y de quienes son como ellos. So we have a story about one chapter later in the Gospel of Matthew. I don't know chronologically how much time has passed, but the message didn't sink in with the disciples. Because we have these families who come to Jesus, who bring their kids, and immediately we can see that the children aren't respected. They aren't given the time of day. The disciples say, uh-uh, no way do you get to come to know Jesus, which I find is so ironic. 
These disciples have come to know Jesus. They've seen him perform miracles, do works, preach about the kingdom of heaven, and have a close personal relationship with him. And yet those who want to come to know about Jesus, they say, no way. He doesn't have the time for you. You don't get to have that relationship with Jesus like we have that relationship with Jesus. Just go away, come at a different time, and then we'll discuss about it. Then you can get to know Jesus, which doesn't, that doesn't make any sense. But Jesus responds differently. In fact, Jesus welcomes the children. He welcomes them. You remember one chapter ago, he says, whoever welcomes a child welcomes me. The disciples essentially act as a barrier between, them, between the children and Jesus, which why would we want to keep our children from Jesus? You wouldn't. But they provide a wall that says, you don't get to know him, but we do. And sometimes as a church, we say, we care about our kids and we know him, but we're not going to make the extra step to make that happen. We want them to really know about God, but they can do that on their own time. We have better things to do as adults. Or that is their parents' duty that they get to teach them. And that is my responsibility to give encouragement every once in a while. Jesus welcomes them, and if Jesus is going to welcome the children, the youth, the younger generation, we need to do that as well. Jesus welcomed them as a part of the family because they were important to the church. As I'm preaching this sermon, I didn't know if I was going to share this story, but I, I thought I would. Um, when I was in youth group, and I went on a youth retreat, we called them a, a, a youth weekend. We went out, we had some great discussions, we had heard some great speakers, we did some singing, and then we came back to the host church that weekend for Sunday morning worship. And we, as all the kids, probably a hundred of us, were sitting in the front few pews of the church. I mean, we were stacked in there deep. We were packed like sardines. And the speaker is talking and talking and talking, and I don't really remember fully what he was saying, but at one point he said, I want all of the kids in these front pew rows, the youth group, the kids, the young adults, I want them to stand up right now, and I'm not going to make our kids do that because that might be kind of scary. But he had to stand up and turn around and face the other church. And that speaker said, church, say hello to the future. Make them see you. Make them understand who you are. And I wonder what would happen if our kids stood up right now and we had to look at them and say, we're going to care about them. It might also make some of us realize that we need to work a little bit harder from that because the reality is they are the future. And if we are not working to help the future, where is the church going to be? Not just our church, but the church as a whole. Where is the kingdom of heaven going to be if we are not going to be there for our children and our youth group? I know I have to work better with them as well. This is not just the message that I want to tell everyone, but what I want us to do is hear this and say, we know that the younger generation is important, so I want us to take that and I want us to invest in the future of the church. You've probably even seen some pictures up here in today's PowerPoint of our youth group, of our kids, which is awesome and great. I want you to see them and know that they are important, that we need to invest in them. I can tell you countless stories of when I grew up in the church and people invested in us and took time and were there at Devo's. Even if they didn't give the Devo, they were just there as personal support and they talked to us. If the future of our church is here today, then we need to act like we care about them. We need to give them our full support. The future of the church is in our children and our youth group. And if we love them like we love God, we should want to have a relationship with them. It's not just on the parents, but it's on all of our shoulders. That is my charge for us today, is I want us to invest in the future of this church. And so I want to ask all of you to ask a very hard question this morning. Am I invested in the future? Think about it. Are you interacting with our youth group and our kids? Are you, when we have sign-ups or events to be with our kids, do you want to be there and sign up to just even say hi to the kids? You know, you can hand them a slice of pizza but just be there. Be there for our kids because they are going to go through a lot of hard moments in their lives. 
And if we know that God loves us and cares for us, they need to know that same exact thing. They need to know that he's going to be there for them on the good days and even the bad days. You have no idea the impact you can have on those kids by just showing up. So I'm asking you to invest in the future of our church today. Make a positive impact on them today for tomorrow. That is my message for all of us this morning. And I know it's not one that's uh, full of redemption and salvation, but I want all of you to know that just as Jesus loved those children, he loves all of us because we are all children of God. And so this morning, if you have anything on your hearts and your minds, if you need some help or prayers, you can come forward as we stand and sing. Or if you want to be baptized, that you want to make Jesus the Savior of your life, you can do that this morning. If there's anything we can do for you, please come as we stand and sing. Let us bow our heads, and I'm going to ask you, if you will, those that want to hold hands, those that want to hold hands, I'm going to give you a few minutes to meditate on your own, on what you are asking God for this morning. And I think what's appropriate is what we just heard, for us to be useful to be accessible and to seek out the young people. O oh, Holy Trinity God, may your mercy, peace, and love be multiplied in all of us, in our children. Trinity God, Father, we thank you for your love and the Son, Savior, Jesus. We thank you for your grace. The comfort of the Holy Spirit, we welcome and we ask for your power. For all of us, for our children, and for the church, the body of Christ, that we may love others even before they love us that we show grace even unto our, our enemies and that the power of the Holy Spirit stir us, stimulate us, make us move, make us have emotion and passion, make us be useful that we may go forth for those that seek you and Lord, as we sang, reign in me. Oh Lord, reign in me, reign in us. And help us to do this, not only for us, but for our children. Thank you, holy God. <laughs>